So our first reading is Psalm 97, which can be found on the back of your handouts that you were given as you came in today. The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world, the earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and the peoples see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols, worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and rejoices, and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, Lord. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hands of the wicked. Light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praises his holy name. Our second reading today is Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, it's already been said, but my name um, is Connor. Um, and yeah, I'm a mission partner here at CCB and have um, enjoyed being a member of CCB for uh, nine years. So um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, shall we kick off? Yes. Shall we kick off? Yes. Um, here's a quote. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshipping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. That is uh, a quote from um, philosopher David Foster Wallace at a commencement uh, speech. Um, and I think he is very right. <laughs> I think he's uh, hit the nail on the head. I think everyone in this room, everyone in Balham, in fact, everyone around the world worships. Everyone gives their kind of focus, their love, their daydreams, their awes, their desires, their money, or the most valuable thing, their time, to something. Everybody worships. And Psalm 97 today um, doesn't make that point. It assumes that point and then goes on to say, look, everybody worships. We all worship, but we're going to be put into two camps. See, the, the thing that you worship will either make you rejoice or the thing that you worship will put you to shame. They're the two camps. The thing that you worship will make you rejoice or the thing that you worship will put you to shame. Um, we're going we're gonna to see this as we go through this psalm. And I guess it's helpful to know, if you haven't been around the psalms, psalms are songs. Psalms are brilliant songs. And I think the thing that they particularly do so well is that they take really quite big and sometimes complex like theological, theological truths and boils them down into beautiful phrases. Phrases that, that can be sung. It's, it's wonderful. It is also what makes them really hard to preach. <laughs> Because uh, psalms are songs, right? So we're not meant to like just analyze them to death, <laughs> to kind of rip the heart of it by just kind of looking at every little detail. So on that note, do you mind if I pray quickly before we carry on? Um, 
So I think we need the Lord's help as we look at this. Father, um, help me today not to make this psalm boring. Help me let the heart of this psalm ring out in a way that it might make us rejoice. Amen. Um, we're just going to work through it bit by bit. Uh, so join me, grab your little bit of paper and, and look at the introduction, the verse one of this psalm. Um, it says this, the Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. Um, this, this little introduction does some helpful things for us. One, it, it places this psalm in the, in the kind of group of psalms that we're preaching over the summer. These psalms have all been about rejoicing and about the whole world rejoicing, about the distant shores rejoicing. Before we move on, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? We are quite a distant shore from Israel. <laughs> um, but secondly, it does something helpful. It kind of, it says right up front, this is where we're going to land. <laughs> if you are singing this song as Israel, you are going to end in rejoicing. So if we don't end rejoicing today, I've done something very wrong. Um, after our introduction, we get like the first stanza of this, of this psalm, verses two to six. And, and this, the, this like little chunk is such a good example of what I was saying before, of taking these kind of big theological things and, and kind of m turning them into praise. And, and particularly what, what the psalmist does here is that he, he ponders upon some of the appearances of God. Some of the times that, that God has shown up and he thinks about why, why did God show himself like that? What, what, what can we learn about why he showed himself like that? And then he, he leads that into, into praise. I don't know if Andrew is here. Andrew, I've got some big words for you. Um, it's like the psalmist does this. He takes a theophany, an appearance of God. He turns it into theology. And then he turns that theology to doxology, into praise. Um, and it's just, it is brilliant. Okay, so I'll show you what I mean. And I think the particular kind of time that the psalmist has got in his mind is the exodus, the, that, that period of Israel's history where God rescues them from Egypt. Um, verse two, look at it. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Now, this happened in the exodus. The Israelites, they were saved from Egypt and they approach Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, the Lord appears and he surrounds the mountain in clouds and darkness. And I think what the psalmist does is that he thinks to that moment and goes, why? Why would God kind of surround himself with clouds and thick darkness? And I think he, he thinks about it for a little while. He, he ponders it and he thinks, oh, is there, is there any other bits of kind of Israel's history or history where, where clouds have been? And he, I think he probably thinks about kind of the flood with Noah, where, where the clouds break and water pours from them and, and God's judgment and justice comes onto the earth through the clouds. And he thinks clouds, ah. Oh. Well, that's got to have something to do with God's justice, right? His judgment. And then he thinks, ah, oh, the thick darkness. It's a bit odd. Well, what happened with the thick darkness is that absolutely no one could enter besides one person. See, the, the unrighteous could not enter the clouds, could not enter the thick darkness. Oh, but Moses could. So it's got to be something about his justice and righteousness. And then he writes, clouds and thick darkness surround him. Ah, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. And he thinks, oh, that's praiseworthy, right? That is something to praise the Lord. Because you see, that's not a given. It is not a given that your God would care about righteousness or justice. It certainly wasn't at the time. Baal didn't care about righteousness and justice. 
Zeus does not care about righteousness of justice. The great pantheon does not care about righteousness and justice. But this God does. Next, he he moves on to the next image. Fire goes before him. And I think the psalmist is thinking, huh, why fire? See, he's, he's heard this story in the Exodus as well, where the great pillar of fire goes before the people. And I think he's sat there and he's going, or she, he's sat there and going, why, why would God appear like fire? And maybe he thinks about it for a little while and goes, okay, well, what happens with fires? Things get burnt up, don't they? <laughs> no one can kind of stand in fire. No, if you, if you come to if you come to fire, you, you get burnt. And, and he starts to think, well, no one can stand before this God. Actually, fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. And actually, that's something to praise, right? If you're little Israel surrounded by enemies, a God who can consume like fire. The next image we have is that of lightning. And and I think think he's saying, what what happens when you see lightning? And what happened at that Sinai moment where God appeared in the cloud and in the fire and in the lightning? Well, what, what does lightning do? For a split second, light just covers everything. Everything is bright. And also, everything is scary. Do you remember seeing lightning for the first time? And the psalmist goes, okay, verse 4, his lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. God can be seen and you don't mess with him. Verse 5, the mountains melt like wax before the Lord. Now, this is an interesting one, isn't it? Why the picture of mountains melting like wax? Well, let's have a think about it. The psalmist thinks, Ah, what is the biggest, most impressive thing around? Well, it's got to be the mountains, right? In fact, it's not that just that they're, they're big and impressive. The mountains, well, they were, they're enduring, right? Long Here, long before any of us were born, <laughs> here, long after any of us will be dead, get these big, Enduring mountains melt like wax before the Lord. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord of all the earth. And this all culminates in verse 6. It's been painting this picture all to get to actually the heavens proclaim his righteousness. And all peoples see his glory. Look up. Look to the heavens. What can you see? More stars than you could possibly hope to count. This God is vast. Not only that, think about it. Every morning, the sun rises. Gives light and life to this world. Then every night, it sets so we can go to bed. (laughs) But even more than that, we even get a little night light. Don't we, as the moon comes up? See, the heavens, they're not just vast and beautiful and glorious. They seem to also just be ordered in such a way that that means life happens, that this God would bring life. Uh, before we move on, I think the fact that, that we all see this and we all know it is interesting. I, I work for a charity where... Um, I work with university students and often kind of do talks and uh, kind of confront people with lots of big questions about God and lots of objections to believing in a God. Time after time, this kind of truth is inescapable. At some point, even people with the, the biggest objections have to come to terms with the fact that they exist. That we exist. And not only do we exist, the world that we inhabit exists. And actually, all the things that 
are most precious, most precious to us are there. Beauty and meaning. At some point, we have to come to terms with the why. Anyway, this first chunk of verse is, is all been about this God and shows that this God is glorious. And then we get verse 7. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols. We've had five verses of amazing words about the law. Why worship an image? Look, um, I wanted to get across why, why the psalmist uses, chooses to use the word shame here. Because it's a big word. It's an important word. Um, to get this across, I am going to do some acting. Bear with me. Um, I've got myself um, an idol. Ah, a bit like, this is my idol. This is a lion, the, the rain god. Um, I am going to do some acting, which is going to look really unfair. I, I'd like to make the point, it is not as unfair as it might seem. These uh, are idols. They're about the same size as this, and they, they would have been made from things that people had, and they would have been of, uh, of images of, of animals or other created things. These are the household gods that have been found in the time of Israel. Um, but I think this might be helpful to see. See, I am a... Sorry, I'm acting. I'm an Israelite. But not, not only that, I'm, I'm a thinking Israelite. I'm an Israelite who's heard the stories from my grandparents of, of the Lord appearing, of the Exodus, how he rescued my people. Um, I'm, also, I'm also an adult that, that can see and look at the world and experiencing uh, creation. And then I choose to worship this little lion god. He's the, he's the god of the rain. And I've seen the Lord, I've seen his creation, and I'm going to choose to worship um, little lion god. And see, I, I'd really love there to be some rain, so I'm, I'm going to pray to um, little lion god of the rain. Please, would you bring the rain? Okay. No rain, and... Lion God has been silent, so look, maybe the problem is that I just haven't prayed hard enough. So please, 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 Lion God, would you bring the rain? Still nothing. Um, okay, well, obviously, I just haven't given enough, right? So I'm going I'm to sit here and I'm going to pray for an hour. Lion God, please, let an hour pass. Please, bring the rain. Still nothing. Okay, clearly I just haven't given enough. Okay, lying God, do you need my money? Go on, take, take my money. Take, what do you need? Still nothing. Okay, well, maybe I need to get, maybe I need to get its attention. Maybe, maybe if I sing, lying God, well, bring the rain. Maybe that will work. Oh no, that's still not, maybe I should get his attention. Maybe if I, if I do a little dance to the lying God, then, then maybe, then maybe you'll answer me. And this last one is, is not a joke, but we, we know that this happens and, and still happens today. Well, maybe my pain will get your attention. Maybe if I beat myself, then that will get your attention. Lion God, would you bring the rain? And there's still no rain. Can you see why the psalmist says this is shameful? I am a thinking adult who can look out on the universe. And I'm choosing to worship this. Before we all think rightly in some ways, that that's just a, a stupid thing that happens um, years and years ago. Well, that quote that I started with from David Foster Wallace carries on. It is it's kind of brutal, really. Pretty much anything you worship 
will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they're where you find tap real meaning in life, you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a thousand deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power, and you'll feel weak and afraid, and you'll need more and more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart. You'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. Shameful. But this psalm, this psalm tells us it is not the only way. Look at verse 7 again. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols, worship him, all you gods. Worship him. There is the Lord. All you gods, I think, is uh, the psalmist referring to, to kind of the spiritual realm and, and the angels. Everybody, worship him. That is, that is the thing that you can do. You don't need to be put to shame. You can worship him. And look what happens when you do. Verse 8, Zion hears and rejoices and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, Lord. Because of your judgments. Have you ever thought for a second why the Lord says, why his first commandment is you'll have no other gods before me? It's because other gods are dumb. They don't do anything. In fact, more than that, they ruin your life. Of course, God would say, you should have no other God before me. He loves you. He, he wants the best for you. And the best for you is to put him in his rightful place. So verse 9, for you, Lord, <clears throat> are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light shines on the righteousness and joy in the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. We all worship. We all worship. But what you worship will either make you rejoice or it will put you to shame. This is what I think Psalm 97 is doing. But it's, it's a helpful clarifier here. I don't think Psalm 97 was written so Israel could gloat, that they could go, oh, Aren't we so good that we have found the Lord and that everyone else is so silly? No, if you spent any time in the Bible or if you spent any time looking at Israel's history, you would know they were very tempted to go after other gods, to worship images. See, I don't think this psalm is written to gloat. No, I think this psalm was written because this is what they needed to hear. They needed to be reminded. They needed to sing of such a glorious Lord that they would put their idols away and destroy them, knowing it would only bring them shame. This is what the psalm did for the Israelites. And I actually think this is what the psalm is doing for us today. But it's worth thinking, uh, how does it change this side of Christ? A little trick if you ever want to study the Psalms, thinking about what it means for us now that Christ has come. The trick is, all the Psalms get better. And this one is no different. See, like the Psalmist here can kind of look at God, can kind of see his appearance or, or see a picture that he sets forth and he can, he can learn for it and it can lead him to praise. Now, now we have the exact image of God. Come as a person. We can see why he might be exalted above all other gods. 
and why we might rejoice in him. I think uh, the, the passage that was read earlier, Paul in Philippians does this far better than I ever could. And I think it's just so Psalm 97-y. So if you, if you want to look it up, you can. If you want to just listen, that's fine. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let me read this again. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by coming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. This is the God who can appear in clouds and thick darkness. This is the God that can appear in fire that consumes all the enemies. This is the God that, that can appear in lightning, that the mountains melt before him, that the whole universe proclaims his glory. And God appears in the form of a servant, a baby. Think, what does, what does that say about our God? He is one humble and glorious God. That he would go to the cross to save people who are tempted to worship images. What a God. And therefore, verse 9, therefore, rightly, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Worship him to the glory of God the Father. Worship him. Oh, to rejoice in a God like Jesus. So this week, I think we should use this psalm in a very similar way. I think we should use it. We all are worshippers. And we're going to be tempted to worship images. In that moment, why don't you use verse 7? Think about it. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols No, what's the opposite. Worship him. See, I can rejoice, we can rejoice in a God who honoured and loved the least. Who not for a single second took advantage of people that had been taken advantage of. I am not going to worship sex this week. I am not going to take advantage of anyone. See, I can rejoice in a God who showed me what real power is. That power lays its life down for others. I am not going to worship power this week and step on others. See, I can rejoice in a God who gave and gave and gave. I'm not going to worship money and hoard and hoard and hoard. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols worship him. We all worship. We will be worshipping this week. What we worship will either lead to rejoicing or it will lead to shame. It's up to us. What will we decide? Why don't I pray? Father, thank you that you've given us every means we could possibly need to know you to see you, and to rejoice in you. Thank you for Christ. Thank you that he is the exact image of the invisible God, that we can see him. We can know what you are like. And Father, as we gaze upon that majesty, would that tear us away from any idol that we might have? 
Would we come and rejoice in you? And with that rejoicing, expel any other idols. Amen.